Hey church, welcome to our time of worship together. I'm Marielle. If you're joining us for the first time, we want to extend a special welcome to you. We're so glad you're here and we're looking forward to an awesome time in the presence of our amazing God today. Our live chat is open to everyone to engage in our worship experience together. And if you have any questions, our pastors would love to connect with you. We also have a live worship experience for our kids at 10.30 a.m. It's a great opportunity for parents and kids to join our kids' ministry team for a time of singing, dancing, praying, and learning together. Age-appropriate Bible story lessons are also available in our kids' online playlist right here on our channel. Today, we're going to be taking communion together as we remember the loving sacrifice of our Savior, Jesus Christ. If you haven't already, please take a moment to prepare your communion elements. You can use juice and bread or whatever you have available to you. We're also going to be hearing from Peter Chu today. He's a member of our congregation, a part-time instructor at Tyndale Seminary, and a trauma and general surgeon at Sunnybrook Health Sciences Center. He'll be continuing our series, Faithful One, on the life of Abraham. Before we head into a time of worship, let's join our hearts in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you that we can gather in our homes and still be able to connect with each other, but more importantly with you, Father. Thank you that we can hear your word for us today. Please quiet our hearts, quiet our minds, and help us receive what you want to say to us today. We thank you for this time. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hey church, so good to be with you again today in this place, wherever this is that you are joining us from today. I'm gonna to read from Romans chapter five. It says, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance produces character and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love, did you hear that? God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. This is good news, friend. This is good news for you and for me and for all the nations of the earth today. We're going to lift our praise to the one who dwells in us, who lives in us, Jesus Christ, alive in us. Come on, stand to your feet if you're able, and let's sing this great song together.
this with us. The enemy. The enemy is under your feet. We are free. We are free.
your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul the work is finished the end is written jesus christ my living friends, and welcome. My name is Norman Musewe. I've been attending People's Church for a few years, and some of you might remember me by seeing me in the parking lot. I'm thankful that today I have my wife, Andra, here, and our niece, Alana, to share this special day together. So welcome then to this uh, very, very special day for all those who proclaim our Lord Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. He wants us to remember him in the really special and unique setting of communing with him in the context of a meal, sharing these physical elements of bread and wine which represent 
his body and blood shed for us. So, brothers and sisters, do this in remembrance of me. Let us remember that it is love that took our Lord Jesus Christ to the cross, into suffering. And it is this theme I want to build on a little bit. When he said, do this in remembrance of me, he was inviting you and I into a daily communing with him, not a once in a while physical ritual. Therefore, we have to ask, what then does this daily communing with him look like? It is this, I believe. We are being invited to join him in his daily suffering, his godly sorrow. And why is that? I would like to pose three reasons for that. The first is because we are sent into a dark world, hopelessness and pain and hurt abound. Secondly, we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. And thirdly, when we suffer in his hands, when we trust him daily, suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance builds our character, which in turn leads to a hope, a glorious hope. I'm not talking here about simply going through pain with masochistically or stoically, or even just positive thinking through pain. But I'm talking about a glorious hope that does not disappoint us. As we remember his suffering each day and enter into it daily with him, we are reminded that God himself has poured his love. Indeed, he has poured himself into our hearts by his Holy Spirit to equip us so that we may go through this suffering, this communing with Christ daily with a glorious hope that is never extinguishable. What then, beloved friends, what then does this communing with Christ to look like to you and I this day? that we are living? What hopeful suffering are we being called into? I would like to propose that there is a pain and a hurt that Jesus is asking us to enter into with him daily. And perhaps for each one of you, there is a special thing that God has presented to you this day that may produce hurt, that may be tearing hearts apart. And it is that, that Jesus wants you to enter into it with him and experience his glory, even through it. I will leave this up to you to meditate upon as we move into the communion. For those of you at home who are prepared, share with us as we break the bread. And for those who may need time, take your time, get some bread ready and some juice, and we can share communion together. The Lord Jesus said, on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread and we had, when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me.
In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This is the new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us drink the cup together. Let us pray together. Lord Jesus, your name is exalted above all gods. How majestic is your name in all the earth. Your love reaches to the heavens, my Lord, and it's deeper than the deepest ocean. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for not shying away from the pain and suffering of the cross on our behalf. Thank you for bearing that pain, that great incomprehensible burden of pain at Calvary. And thank you, Lord, that as you invite us into communion with you, you shape us, you protect us, you mature us, and you fill us with a an hope, an amazing hope, a glorious hope, because you continuously pour your love into our hearts by your Holy Spirit to equip us, to enable us. Thank you, Jesus. We pray this in your name. Amen. Hello, church. I'm Hartley. Hey, church. I'm Isaiah. What a powerful start to our time of worship together. Wherever you're joining us from, we're so glad you're here with us today. We're now going to express our worship by giving towards our tithes, offerings, and faith promise gifts. On the last Sunday of each month, like today, we also highlight the opportunity to give towards a benevolent fund. This is a special way we get to share within our local church community by giving when we have resources to share and by receiving when we have need. Benevolent gifts can be made through any of our giving channels, through our church app and website, or by mailing your gift to the church building. If you'd like to make a benevolent request, you can head to the church website and click on the I Need Care button located on the home page. Church, as we continue to express our worship together today, we remember that there are currently more than 260 million Christians in our world who are being persecuted because of their faith in Jesus. Since last Sunday, we've been using the Open Doors World Watch List to pray over the countries and regions where Christians are facing the most extreme persecution. Today, we're going to be praying over Africa. Open Doors researchers have reported that violent persecution has continued in several African countries under COVID-19 restrictions. This is particularly true in Nigeria. Lockdown has caused economic devastation on top of years of poverty and hardship. What's worse is that believers often face discrimination in receiving government or local relief. This is Rose's story. <laughs> Nazuna Sam Warga Haka Kabori and a Jira Patini when the Zakao Azwa Sashi. Say na na je na bina kurfi halin and aje wate Hari and Jam Bude Mushi na Genshi na Mishi Adua Nasalama.
Odeanzo Kuma Gashibu Nua Ba Binchi Ba Kudima Belecho Musia Binchi Dakas want to enter Muna E. Bafita Ambia Rufeuli. Tamuzamunja <laughs> We stand in the power of prayer together with Rose and her brothers and sisters facing persecution in Africa. In 1 Corinthians 12, we're reminded that in Christ, we are all part of one body. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Let's pray for our brothers and sisters in Africa. Dear God, we thank you that you're a merciful and loving God. We ask that you be with them let them know that you're there with them and give them courage and strength to face this persecution. We ask that if possible, you allow them to escape the persecution or change the heart of the persecutor. We ask this in your name. Amen. You can learn more about the Persecuted Church in our world and continue to join us in prayer throughout the week by downloading the World Watch List on the Church app and website and using our prayer playlist here on our channel. Thank you for joining us as we pray with the Persecuted Church in our world. Now let's join Peter for today's message. Hello, People's Church. It's good to be with you today as we continue our study on the life of Abraham. Last week, Brett took us through chapters 13 and 14, where Abraham and Lot parted ways with Lot choosing the fertile valley of the Jordan with its excitement and the bright lights of the two cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. What I'd like to do is remember four observations related to Lot's choice that Brett highlighted. First, the moral assessment in Sodom and Gomorrah. They were wicked and sinning greatly against the Lord. Second, there's a plot spoiler. We find out that the cities are destroyed in chapter 13, well before the event is actually described in chapter 19. Why does God ruin the story by telling us how it ends? Third, Brett highlighted Lot's movement from pitching his tents near the city of Sodom to living inside the city, and ultimately we find him sitting at the city gates, embedded into the life of the city, either as a city elder or at least transacting business. And then lastly, contrast to Lot, Brett highlighted Abraham's decision to distance himself from Sodom. He declined the offer of spoil from the king. Today, we're skipping ahead to chapter 18 at the next intersection between the life of Abraham and the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. Our text for today is chapter 18, verses 16 to 33. As you turn there, let me give you some context. As the chapter opens, God decides to take a road trip with two angels and visit Abraham. The first half of the road trip and the visit is about life. God announces that in a year's time, Abraham and Sarah will have a son. The second half of the visit is about death, as God pronounces his judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah. Let's read the passage together. When the men got up to leave, they looked down towards Sodom, and Abraham walked with them to see them on their way. Then the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do? Abraham will surely become a great and powerful nation, and all nations of the earth will be blessed through him. For I have chosen him so that he will direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just, so that the Lord will bring about for Abraham what he has promised him. Then the Lord said, The outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great and their sins so grievous that I will go down 
and see if what they have done is as bad as the outcry that has reached me. If not, I will know. The men turned away and went towards Sodom, but Abraham remained standing before the Lord. Then Abraham approached him and said, Will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? What if there are 50 righteous in the city? Will you really sweep it away and not spare the place for the sake of the 50 righteous people? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to kill the righteous with the wicked, treating the righteous and the wicked alike. Far be it from you. Will not the judge of all the earth do right? The Lord said, If I find 50 righteous people in the city of Sodom, I will spare the whole place for their sake. Then Abraham spoke up. Now that I have been so bold as to speak to the Lord, though I am nothing but dust and ashes, what if the number of the righteous is five less than 50? Will you destroy the whole city because of five people? If I find 45 there, he said, I will not destroy it. I'm going to skip down to verse 32. Then he said, may the Lord not be angry, but let me speak just once more. What if only 10 can be found there? He answered, for the sake of 10, I will not destroy it. When the Lord had finished speaking with Abraham, he left and Abraham returned home. This text is about intercession, prayer on behalf of another. Now, this is actually the first description of intercession in the entire Bible, but there's one problem. It's a failure. The cities were destroyed. If intercession is something that Abraham and we as believers are to do, why would the first example God provide be a failure? It can't be about how to intercede, even though that is what we love to find, a formula, a ritual, a special prayer, that if we follow it, God must do what we ask him. We are desiring to find a way to control God, to manipulate God, to oblige him to do what we want. But what if the point of the passage is not how to intercede, but there's another message. Keep this in mind as we walk through the passage. The passage can be outlined by looking at dialogue, who is speaking and who is listening. Verses 16 to 19 is what is called a soliloquy. God is speaking to himself. Only the audience, the reader, is aware of what God says. Abraham and the two men, the two angels, are unaware. Verses 20 and 21 is a monologue. God is speaking. Abraham and the two men, the two angels, are listening, but they don't answer. And verses 22 to 23 is the true dialogue. As God and Abraham go back and forth, negotiating the outcome of the two cities. Soliloquy, monologue, dialogue. Let's look at the soliloquy first, verses 16 and 19. What is a soliloquy? It is a writing or a theatrical device in which a character speaks, but what he is speaking is only heard by the audience or the reader. The other characters are unaware. Now in a play, that can be portrayed by either having a character alone on the stage or he could be on the stage with other characters, but there's a spotlight only on him. The other characters are in darkness, and maybe they're frozen. They don't move. The point of a soliloquy is that everything that is said in a soliloquy is understood to be true, actual, trustworthy, and certain. Now, when God speaks in soliloquy, it's doubly true because first, it's God speaking. And secondly, because it's inside a soliloquy, it's absolutely true because these are the very thoughts of God. A soliloquy is used when you want to reveal the purpose, the motives, the intent of a character. And through the soliloquy, you find out more about the nature of the character. As the audience, the reader, gains this inside information, we're drawn into the story. We move from being passive observers to active participants in the story. What are the contents of the soliloquy? 
First, it begins with a rhetorical question. Shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do? There are two implications from this rhetorical question. First, God is about to reveal to Abraham something secret. The answer to the rhetorical question is understood to be, no, I'm not going to hide. I'm going to tell him. And what he reveals to him is something that would otherwise be a mystery known only to God. But by giving Abraham this inside information, Abraham has now become a prophet. God has led him into his counsel, C-O-U-N-S-E-L, and also counsel, C-O-U-N-C-I-L. He gets to participate in the plans of God. The second implication is that God tips his hand. He's about to do something. Shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do? The reader puts it all together. The men are heading down to Sodom. We know Sodom and Gomorrah are destroyed from chapter 13. We put it together and we realize God is about to tell Abraham his plans to destroy the two cities. What follows next are three reasons why God would share this special knowledge with Abraham, this inside information. First, the absolute certainty that the promises God gave Abraham would come true. God himself reiterates the promises. He will surely become a great and powerful nation, the, bless, the promises of descendants and land. And all the nations of the earth will be blessed through him. God himself assures us that these promises will come true. He assures us inside a soliloquy. These are the very thoughts of God. And lastly, he uses the word surely to emphasize that these promises will come true. The second reason he gives for giving Abraham this inside information is Abraham's special relationship with God. For I have chosen him. The word God uses communicates a very unique relationship, a particular intimacy. What God is really saying is, Abraham is my special friend. He has a unique place with me. And because of this, I am going to share something with him. The last reason why God shares this information is the responsibility placed on Abraham and his family. He and his children are to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just. At the end of the soliloquy, we have two questions. What is the way of the Lord? And how will Abraham bless all the nations of the earth? Let's move on. Verses 20 and 21, God now speaks in monologue. He speaks, Abraham and the men and the angels are listening, but they don't respond to him. The scene is set up as a judicial inquiry. God is the judge. That's implied by how the conversation is set up. And his role as judge is actually attested to by Abraham in verse 25. Shall not the judge of all the earth do what is right? The accused are the two cities, Sodom and Gomorrah. What are the charges? The outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great and their sin is so grievous. Notice the adjectives that emphasize the magnitude of the sin of the two cities. And then we have the inquiry. We have a series of verbs. I will go down, I will see, and I will know. Whenever we have a series of verbs, the last verb is the climactic key verb. The reason why I'm going to go down is so I can see. And the reason why I'm going to see is so that I will know. What will God know? If the outcry is as bad. Now, notice something very interesting. God actually says, if not, I will know. He could have easily said, if so but he chooses if not. By using if not, what God is really saying is, I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt. I'm going to presume it is not as bad as what I'm hearing. Why would God give Sodom and Gomorrah the benefit of the doubt that the outcry is not as great as the rumors? 
What's the purpose for God's monologue? I think there are two reasons. One, he wants to tell Abraham and the reader he is going to follow due process. He will not render judgment based on rumors or reputation or reports. He will render judgment based on evidence that he gathers firsthand himself. The second reason for the monologue is how will Abraham respond? God is going to reveal to him what he's about to do. What will Abraham do as a result? He knows what God will find when he goes down there. He knows Sodom and Gomorrah is the epicenter of evil and wickedness in Canaan. He himself has distanced himself from the two nations. Well, Abraham has three options. He can do nothing. Don't get involved. Stay out of it. He can actually cheer God on. God, thank you for wiping out the source of evil and wickedness in Canaan. He can applaud God's execution of justice and righteousness. He can be like Jonah, basically. Or Abraham can step in, intercede, and ask God, can you not change your plans? Appeal to God's mercy. And Abraham would be the anti-Jonah. Now, stepping in and interceding requires a different kind of love. There is the love that depends on what you know about someone. And then there is love that is despite what you know about someone. And intercession often requires a love that is despite what you know about someone. God knows everything about us. He still chooses to love us. Jesus knows everything about us, and he still chose to die on the cross for us in our place. We move on to the third part of the story, the dialogue. The question hanging over the dialogue is now, what will Abraham do with this knowledge? We begin with a contrast. The two men, the angels, get up and they start heading down towards Sodom. We read that Abraham remains standing before the Lord. The English doesn't really capture what Abraham did. The two men head down towards Sodom and what Abraham really does is he steps right in front of God. He is physically blocking God, the creator of the universe, from walking down to Sodom because Abraham knows what God will find. Imagine the audacity of standing in front of God to try to block him physically from going to Sodom. That is what Abraham did. What proceeds is a series of negotiations. We have six rounds of negotiations, but the first round of negotiations is the key. That is the round in which Abraham and God settle on. Is it even possible to discuss the fate of the two cities? What are the principles for discussion? And what is the starting point? What Abraham is doing is really exploring uncharted territory. What is God really like? What is the way of the Lord? Are there boundaries to his mercy? How do his justice and his righteousness match up with his mercy and his love? How far can I push God? What influence do I have with God? What influence will God allow Abraham to have? Abraham begins by asking a rhetorical question. Will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? The question is pushing justice. It is not fair to treat the righteous and the wicked the same God. You can't destroy righteous with the wicked. But then notice very carefully, Abraham skillfully and really brilliantly uses flattery, hyperbole, a rhetorical question, a hypothetical scenario, and a little bit of sarcasm. And he moves from asking God to act justly to God, will you not act mercifully? What he moves to is, God, will you not spare all the wicked on account of the righteous. Justice is not treating the righteous and the wicked the same. 
Justice is sparing the righteous while punishing the wicked. Mercy is sparing the wicked on account of the righteous. And that is where Abraham moves. He starts off asking for justice, but he ends up asking for mercy. God, can you not value the righteous more than the wicked? What Abraham is doing is trying to redefine the math of morality. Before Genesis 18, the thinking was one righteous person, one wicked person. But what Abraham is trying to propose to God is, God, can you not value the righteous more than the wicked? He holds his breath and he waits to see what God will say. God agrees. If I find 50 righteous people in the city of Sodom, I will spare the whole place for their sake. Now, God could have acted justly. He could have said, I will spare the righteous. The preceding story is anything too difficult for God. He can bring life and a child to a barren couple. He can spare Rahab's family as the walls of Jericho collapse around them. He can protect his people of Israel from the devastation of the plagues that are affecting the rest of Egypt. God could have easily acted justly, but he decides to accept Abraham's proposal and act mercifully. I will spare the whole place for 50 righteous people. Having secured God's agreement on the principles, the next verses, the next five rounds is really working out the numbers. And Abraham moves God from 50 to 45 to 40 to 30, down to 10. And what Abraham has done and what God has agreed to is for an entire city of wicked people, God will accept 10 righteous people. Oh, I hope this works. That is how Abraham has changed the math of morality. And God agreed to it. Now, pay close attention to the negotiations. And you will see that it is the most unusual, unconventional, almost crazy deal-making. First, notice that God never makes a counteroffer. God never makes a counteroffer. Abraham says 50, God says fine. Abraham says 45, God says fine. He gets down to 30, fine. God never pushes back and says 32, 23. God never makes a counteroffer. What kind of deal making is this? Secondly, God never quibbles over the quality of the righteous, men, women, children, the degree of morality. He doesn't even argue about who decides what is the standard of determination. He just agrees. And then lastly, contrast how wordy Abraham is. He has this long flowery introduction before he gets to the actual number. And then God's answers are very short to the point. Basically, God is almost giving his answer before Abraham finishes talking. There is an eagerness, an urgency to God's agreeing to each of Abraham's proposals. What is the message behind God's unconventional, crazy deal-making? The message is to Abraham and to us, you want to know what the way of the Lord is? This is the way of the Lord. My desire is to show mercy. I want to show mercy. I will judge, make no mistake, but that is my reluctant act. And in the way God negotiates this deal, the unconventional nature, the bizarre nature, where he never makes a counterposal, just agrees, 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 he is communicating, this is the way of the Lord. My desire is to show mercy. We know how the story ends in the next chapter. There are not 10 righteous. The cities are destroyed as God rains fire down from heaven. Lot and his two daughters are spared. And as Brett pointed out last week, more because of God's mercy than Lot's righteousness. 
If our passage today is the first description of intercession, why is it a failed attempt? I think it's because the point of the message is not how to intercede, but why intercession is even possible. The why of intercession is related to the who of intercession. Let me illustrate with this slide. The slide illustrates what uh, I call the triangle of intercession. There is God, there's the beneficiary, the person or the group of people in need, and then there's the intercessor, Abraham and ourselves. These are the three people, the three parties involved in intercession. Intercession is possible because of who is involved. Why would God answer Abraham's prayer? Why would Abraham ask? And as we look at the character of each person, we will discover what the way of the Lord is and how Abraham and we are to bless the nations. Let's look at God first. Three things. God is wholly capable, omnipotent, of accomplishing his purposes, omnicompetent. He can bring life and give a child to Abraham and Sarah. He can bring death and destroy two cities. God is wholly capable. Brett introduced us to Abraham's worship of God as El Shaddai, the God who takes care of everything. Two weeks ago, Danielle Strickland taught us that our God is enough. And because he is enough, we live in gratitude. God is just. Shall not the judge of all the earth do what is right? God gathers evidence before rendering judgment. He will not punish the righteous with the wicked, but he will judge the wicked. And then the big message from this passage, God's desire is to extend mercy. There are actually seven features in this story that reinforces that message. First, he reveals to Abraham what he's about to do. He's drawing Abraham to intercede because the two cities are not in a position to do so for themselves. Second, he gives Sodom and Gomorrah the benefit of the doubt. If not, I will know. The starting point for God is the presumption of innocence of the two cities. Third, Abraham begins asking for justice, but he ends up asking for mercy, and God agrees. Fourth, we've talked about this, God never presents a counteroffer. The brevity of of God's responses in contrast to Abraham's worthiness. God wants to agree. He almost gives his answer to Abraham's proposals before Abraham even finishes talking. And even though 10 righteous people are not found, God still spares Lot and his two daughters. And then lastly, what is negotiated is so out of balance and lopsided that we see the lavishness of God's grace. Imagine 10 righteous people for an entire city. That math is so crazy. But do you realize what God has opened the door to when he agrees that he will spare an entire city for 10 righteous people. What God has done is he's opened the door that one perfect, sinless son of God will redeem the entire world. That is what God has shown to Abraham. Abraham, if you're willing to propose a change to the math, I am willing to agree to it because my desire is to show mercy. My desire is so great to show mercy that I will send my son to redeem the entire humanity. That is what God has done with the math of salvation. We often think of God that his nice attributes are balanced out by his nasty attributes, as illustrated in this slide. 
But Exodus 34, verse 6 and 7, paints a different picture. The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Those are a list of his nice attributes. Yet, what follows is his nasty attributes. He does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the fathers to the third and the fourth generation. The next slide illustrates that our God is not balanced. He is lopsided. Look at the number of nice attributes against the one nasty attribute. Look at his willingness to forgive thousands versus punishing to the fourth generation. The point is that our God is lopsided. But in our favor, he desires to show mercy. He will judge. Make no mistake about that. But that is his reluctant act. What about the intercessor, Abraham? He plays a critical role. He connects the resources and the mercy of God with the needs of Sodom and Gomorrah. And this is the role through which Abraham and we can bless the nations around us. Abraham has a special standing before God. Abraham is God's special friend. We have the same standing through Jesus Christ. God reveals his plans to us. God invites us to participate in his work. The question that, is faced, that we face is, what are we going to do about it? Am I going to do nothing? Or am I actually going to get involved? And the first step in getting involved is praying appealing to divine resources, appealing to divine mercy. Why would we get involved? We may get involved out of obligation. We may get involved and step into this place of intercession for justice. We're pushing back against oppression and violence. We may get involved because we love someone, we care for someone. But remember, love can be because we know something about someone, Love also is despite what we know about someone, those who are not easy to love. And then the boldness and the audacity of Abraham and the persistence with which he interceded. Let me bring this home. What is the way of the Lord? God loves despite what he knows about us. He desires to show mercy, but he will enforce justice and righteousness. All of humanity for his son. And he's inviting us to participate in his work because of our standing in Jesus Christ. That's God. What about us? We will bless the nations when we live according to the way of the Lord. Through Jesus, we have the same standing with God that Abraham had. God will show us things. He will tell us things. Are we looking? Are we listening? Our church is in the midst of praying for the persecuted church. I would encourage you to go to the church website, download the Open Doors Prayer Guide, and let us join together in praying for our brothers and sisters around the world who are suffering and facing great difficulty and danger for Jesus Christ. When you pray for our brothers and sisters, that will be the first step to even praying for the world beyond the church. We are struggling in the season of COVID. How are each of us praying for our cities, for our province, for our country, and for the world? The information is revealed to us. What will we do? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this picture of the life of Abraham and just this crazy, bizarre negotiation which shows us the way of the Lord is to show mercy and that judgment is your reluctant act. May we each ponder your way and how we can walk in it 
and to respond to what you show us by first pausing in our days and praying and accessing the resources and the mercy of the creator of the universe. We thank you. We thank you for the relationship and the privilege that we have to come before you in Jesus Christ. Amen. We hope you were blessed throughout our time together today. You can use our study questions in the video description below to dive deeper into today's message. Please continue to join us as we stand with our brothers and sisters who are being persecuted because of their faith all around our world. You can pray with us using the prayer playlist here on our channel and the Open Doors World Watch List, which is available on our church website and app. This coming Saturday and Sunday, you'll have the opportunity to shop at our online People's Fair Trade Market. It's an opportunity to shop for products and gifts as you support businesses who are putting people and planet ahead of profit. You'll have access to free shipping and special promo codes on select brands and products. You can visit the church website to learn more. Next Sunday, our series on the life of Abraham continues with our lead pastor, Brett. It's always so great worshiping with you, church. Have a great week.